Um, and we're going to have a lively conversation about the state of the industry right now. So to start off with, rather than me introduce, I'd love to hear from each one of our groups. Maybe we'll go Sherman, Ashley, and then Justin. Um, tell us a little bit about yourselves and how you got into the space that you are now. Um, maybe take like two to five minutes on that. I'd love to hear kind of those stories and what got you to where you are now. Go ahead, Sherman. Sure. Hey, thanks, Dan. It's great to see everyone on this, um, uh, this call. Great to see uh, Justin and Ashley as well. Um, yeah, I started my career as a computer scientist, actually here at Stanford. Uh, I was uh, trained in computer science under Pepe Lee's lab. Uh, I did a bunch of machine learning research, mainly into computer vision space with her. Uh, and then I took a few years after I graduated from undergrad here uh, to work uh, in Silicon Valley um, as a health tech product manager. Um, I was at a company called Patient Ping. We designed care coordination products and primarily served a bunch of health payers and health systems across the country focused on closing care coordination gaps. And it gave me a really healthy appreciation, not just for how data can be leveraged to improve healthcare uh, problems, but also kind of like the advent of value-based care. A lot of our business model was founded on that shift. Um, and also just like the deep uh, sort of seated problems with like um, clinical operations at its core, uh, working a lot actually with emergency departments was our initial customer um, at, at patient paying. Um, and then in my mid twenties, I decided to make the, the non-obvious jump into medicine myself actually. And so I uh, left that job and uh, jumped into medical school and also in venture capital um, around the same time. Um, and then throughout my medical training, I've basically been um, been been uh, doing things on both sides. In medical school, I started a venture studio in New York uh, that was physician led. Uh, we started a number of companies across healthcare SaaS companies, across primary care, across maternal health, um, and uh, had the pleasure of seeing kind of the early stages of that those companies grow up into Series A, Series B uh, stages where they were much larger. Um, but getting a chance to kind of you know see. Uh, you know, cl uh, clinical medicine up close as a medical student and also, um, you know, uh, work in healthcare entrepreneurship was a really kind of gratifying balance. Uh, and one of them I'm excited to continue now um, uh, as, a, as a resident, actually. So I'm now currently a second year EM resident at Stanford, uh, but I spent uh, some time uh, working on the investment team at Andreessen Horowitz um, as a venture fellow. Um, and I primarily focus on, you know, the space of healthcare AI, my background, and, and tech-enabled care delivery models. That's the kind of other piece of focus for me. Um, currently uh, sit on two company uh, boards as an observer and have made about six investments across those two spaces over the last two years. So, uh, yeah, really excited about this space and uh, grateful to be um, back at Stanford representing the other piece of my uh, background. Great. Thanks, Sherman. Love to hear from you, Ashley, about your background, too. Yeah, uh, I am a mechanical engineer by training, but I also have an MBA. I have spent uh, most of my career in the medical device industry uh, in strategy, marketing, uh, product management type roles. Uh, I took a left turn about six years ago. I decided to go to the Stanford Biodesign Program. Um, I went to the Executive Education Program and kind of fell in love. Um, Knowing that I wanted to get into startups and applied to the program, got in. Uh, out of that program, I started a company, which I ran for two years. Uh, it was in the drug delivery space. Um, and we did great with grants. And when I realized we weren't a venture uh, backable um, program, uh, I realized they also didn't need a full-time CEO. So uh, when I started looking for my next role, uh, I ended up as a venture fellow at uh, Sante Ventures. So I spent a year doing that. Uh, the idea of that program for, for Sante is that uh, we bring in entrepreneurs, teach them um, investment from the inside out, and then have them go start a company. And so I ended up running um, Sante Excel, which is uh, our, our seedling of portfolio companies, really our uh, venture studio inside Sante. We do a lot of company formation, et cetera. So uh, I'm now entering my uh, third year in this role. Um, we've we've done a handful of investments, uh, startup, uh, actually starting companies, um, you know, finding great ideas and bringing entrepreneurs and, and money around that to, to get them going. Great. Thanks. And Justin, let's hear your story as well. Great. Thanks so much for having me here. Nice to see some familiar faces. Uh, so by a background, I started out as a computer scientist, but uh, medicine was always the plan. So I started out doing undergrad in computer science and then a master's in machine learning and genomics, and then came to Stanford for uh, medical school, uh, which became medical schools and business school. 
as what frustrated me was just trying to combine technology on the one hand with how we actually uh, practice clinical care. Um, and, you know, being at a place like Stanford, you get exposed to all this amazing research about people, what's happening, uh, but then also started getting connected to what was happening. Oh, let's see if my audio is coming through here. You're good. Perfect. Uh, uh, around around campus, uh, what was happening in Silicon Valley, Valley probably. Um, so I started taking uh, clinical detours off the traditional path. Um, part of the team that helped uh, step out to launch the Stanford Center for Digital Health. We we're doing some of the first telemedicine visits out of Epic, um, looking at evaluating technology from outside the university and actually thinking about how we deploy that um, in, the, in the health center. Uh, and then uh, jumped over to Apple on the healthcare team, getting to see and launch some of the women's health features that are live today, as well as research um, going on around the world. And uh, I got really excited about this idea of scale. How do we scale you know, great care that's being delivered um, more broadly and got fascinated by, by AI? Uh, the big difference though, uh, was if we were ever gonna use AI in healthcare, we would need to know how it's performing, uh, that these tools are safe, um, and we can't just, you know, A, B test our way to the finish line like we do at, you know, Google serving, serving ads. Um, and so started a company called Trustworthy AI, uh, where we're evaluating safety and performance of, of algorithms. Uh, at the time, actually, no one cared in healthcare. Um, so we actually pivoted that company to focus on the autonomous vehicle space, uh, where hopefully some of you have gone and taken Waymo rides now, where that core technology is uh, now part of the Waymo. Waymo ecosystem as part of the safety simulation evaluation infrastructure. Uh, kind of with that hodgepodge set of backgrounds, that's how I ended up uh, in venture capital. Um, I became a partner at GSR Ventures, where I spent five years doing early stage investments in healthcare AI, um, and ended up joining uh, faculty at Stanford in bioinformatics, where I still teach on digital health and generative AI in medicine. Uh, today, um, actually, based on spending my time in that space and seeing what's possible, I've actually decided to make the transition back to found another company, tackling some of these same issues around algorithm safety and trust performance as it applies to healthcare. Um, so I can talk more about that later uh, if, if the group is interested. Great. So as uh, everybody can see, we have a huge amount of experience and wealth of knowledge uh, among our panelists here. So I think we're gonna, what we're gonna do is jump into some questions now that I'd love to hear each of your experience in and your opinions on. Um, the first that we're gonna go after is, so uh, AI and healthcare AI has actually been around for a long time. It seems like it's brand new to a lot of people, but it's been around for a long time. I was just checking uh, that Mycin, one of the original bioinformatics algorithms, uh, was published two days before I was born. And as I can see with this great lighting in our studio, I have more gray hair than I'd like to admit. So it's been a long time since we've started down this journey. But I'd love to get your guys' opinion about, especially from a business perspective, what's different this time around? Like, what is it that seems to be making a lot of people like you, Justin, jumping into the startup space again and, the, and everybody else so excited about this space this time from a business perspective? Um, and feel free to whoever wants to take that on. Give a first uh, impression. I think you know that the healthcare enterprise sort of customer stakeholders are increasingly aware and also excited about piloting and trying these solutions more so than we've ever seen in healthcare. I think you know even th five years ago, Dan, uh, you know before the advent of like generative models, like it was so hard to get one of our portfolio companies to kind of get through the chain, the long sales cycles of healthcare. But now, like you know, healthcare payers, the recent survey, I think about seventy percent of the national payers are in some way experimenting with AI, you know, either internally or partnering with external vendors. There's just so much more like uh, customer sort of interest on the enterprise side. And that's shifted the conversations tremendously for a lot of our portfolio companies. Um, yeah, as to what's driving that, you know, I think it's a lot of the, um, you know, I, I wouldn't even say hype now. I would say like there's a lot of sort of adoption, uh, consumer adoption, uh, especially of large language models. Um, you know, people seeing kind of the power of how, um, you know, well-trained models uh, can perform on, you know, tasks like medical tests. Um, but also, you know, I would say a better sort of trend that we're seeing is a lot of staffing shortages across the industry um, are starting to 
force you know some type of change like do we hire more humans that are you know expensive require on ranking time are there tasks that we can start to um, concede to ai agents or ai enabled humans for example to do more efficiently uh, and i'm sure we'll get a little bit more into that conversation as well great yeah i think we're we're seeing also just the ai as so much more useful than it was um you know the the leaps and bounds that we've made in the last year uh have actually you know, significantly moved the ball forward for a lot of companies and the things that they're trying to do. Um, we're seeing adoption, not just in healthcare, but across the board and, you know, becoming part of our daily lives. And I think people are excited about uh, kind of the ways that we can implement that. And I think for, you know, us at Sante, um, one of the things that we see as well is the actual, like, taking sort of what's a theoretical idea uh, and actually coming up with things that are um, useful, that um, make a huge difference, that, that they're actually like thinking through the business model and um, being a lot more like things that we can invest in and, and uh, you know, again, uh, see the, the exits, et cetera, that we expect. Great. I'll, I'll just add on a few things. So one, you know, this is the fastest adopted technology we've ever seen in the world. First to a million, then 100 million users, 200 million active users. The more important question in my head, though, is why is it the fastest adopted technology ever? And, and the reason is performance. If we looked back, as you know, Dan mentioned, AI has been around forever. Uh, but if we look at performance, and there's great charts showing on basic tasks like transcription, image recognition, um, reasoning, these, these tools were toys just five, six years ago. You know, and some of our own researchers at Stanford were testing these on medical exams and things like this, and they were barely better than chance. But fast forward to today, these tools are now performing, you know, above, in many cases, human level performance. And all of a sudden, that completely changes how we're able to interact with these tools. And that, that's what has created the interest from health systems to adopt these tools, from people actually getting use out of their daily lives. And today we're seeing you know, a study in the UK published a couple of weeks ago, 20% of GPs are using tools like ChatGPT for clinical care. The, the AMA published research at the end of last year, around 20% of physicians are experimenting uh, with tools like this for clinical care. So the, the difference in uh, for why we see these opportunities is fundamentally to me performance. Okay. So to key off of that, you said there's been a lot of adoption. There's obviously has been a fair amount of hype over the last two years. Um, one of our previous speakers was maybe uh, giving us the concern that winter is returning to the AI space in the next few years because we've hyped everything up so much. Um, I'd love to hear from you guys when it comes especially to healthcare AI. Like, where are you seeing people actually get true business value? Like, basically, where's the real uh, ROI, like the practical applications? And if you could give some examples to that, too, I'd love to hear where you're seeing real value being generated with these systems now. I can take that one first. I think places that we're seeing uh, the most value are places where humans either um, don't have the the like radiology where obviously really skilled radiologists are seeing uh, cancer etc but you can get to a different level with ai uh, and certainly you know say hey like check out this area etc uh, so making kind of human skills better i think the other place as well is where um it's either too tedious or too complex for um, someone to figure out. So, uh, and things like um, scheduling or, um, uh, you know, looking at um, sort of some of that calculation side of things where, uh, again, your normal person can't just look at it and, and think through it, uh, but where you're actually um, bringing in the AI to do a, a better, more thorough job, especially for those tedious tasks that humans uh, tend to make mistakes on when they get bored. Yep. Yeah, I can add on to that. I feel like our team has seen a lot of different um, approaches over the years. I would say for us, it kind of like splits into what is kind of like consumer facing versus enterprise facing. If you take what's enterprise facing, there's actually a lot of non-clinical tasks that we would say are you know, purely administrative, for example, uh, versus clinical tasks, like what Justin had mentioned about clinical decision support with these GPs. 
And I think a lot of the early applications and investments that have been made in the space have focused around kind of the back office administrative tasks that don't need to be tightly regulated because they're purely following kind of human roles that humans have wrote at some point. So a great example is like prior auth, for example, was I think a lot of the earliest applications of Gen AI to, to healthcare specifically. Um, you had these, you know, bespoke rules that payers were enforcing that were written by humans and manually also enforced by humans. The thought was, could we just apply AI to automatically start, you know, approving sort of what should be prior authorizations and, and authorized um, based on the set of rules. And it turns out, you know, when when uh, Cigna and, and some other national payers started to implement this, uh, we started to see denial rates go up, but it wasn't because they were getting denied more, it's because the speed of denials were happening more quickly. And so that led to like lawsuits and things that were happening. But I think it just provided, at least for us, sort of a, an opportunity to, to, to take a look at sort of across the healthcare ecosystem, what, what, what sort of tasks can be um, you know, that's currently manually being done by a human today that doesn't require any clinical or regulatory oversight, um, can AI, you know, have a piece in, in, in uh, doing a little bit more effectively. So for us, it's a lot of the administrative, the fintechs piece of it, the financial OS, uh, revenue cycle, for example, these are some of the applications that we've seen a lot of great uh, uptake in. Um, and I'll share in case people uh, want to read, we published a blog post a while back about the different jobs to be done, uh, commercializing, especially in the enterprise side. Uh, and it lists a couple of the things that we've invested in in the past. Yeah, I'll just add on, maybe if it's not the most exciting part to this group, but people are, are following the money, which often is not on things like clinical decision support um, and uh, you know, wellness tools, ways to do our jobs better, it's on the back end, administrative side, revenue cycle. And so if you look at surveys from health systems where they most focused on um, in AI, it's on these back office tasks that can help them, you know, bill more effectively, do that job faster um, and get paid more. Uh, that's where people are starting. And we'll get to, uh, you know, more clinical applications later. But if if you look in investment and thanks for sharing some of the some of the articles as well, that's where that's where the dollars have gone. And from that perspective, does that seem more that that's once again where there's the most value, or that happens to be with the technology that we have from healthcare AI, that's where the that's where the impact can be the most. So, are you sensing that oh maybe there's not as much impact in the clinical decision support space? Or it's just that there's not the obvious value or that they, these other things like regulation and things like that are holding it back. Is there a general sense of why that push has been? Yeah, I mean, I think I it's the regulation piece of it, right? We're, yes. we're not there. People aren't comfortable. It's like the self-driving uh, cars in, in San Francisco. Yep. Like People get really nervous, and I think the bar is going to be much, much higher to um, start to adopt some of those technologies. So it's the low-hanging fruit that's getting picked off first right now. Um, I, mean, I think it's coming. It's just a matter of getting everybody comfortable with the idea. Okay. Yeah. I mean, to your, to your question, Dan, I think there's incredible value, right, on the clinical um, AI piece. I think we're just not there yet, like Ash was saying, on the, on the regulatory piece. But, you know, we'll get there in time. I think it's a matter of where do we marry kind of the AI into humans? Where does human in the loop kind of work from a clinical decision-making perspective? Are we going to start with kind of chart summarization? Are we going to start with clinical augmentation and then slowly move to true AI doctor? Um, yep. You know, I think that I think that remains to be seen. And then if we can just quickly double down on that regulation, right? Because regulation can be, a, in some ways, a tool um, to provide business value because it allows you to create moats and whatnot around things. What has been your general um, feeling and what your startups that you're working with, how are they bumping up against that regulation and where is it potentially beneficial and where is it really holding us aback? Where is it being helpful? Where has it been a big opportunity blocker for us? Uh, I can start. It, it comes up everywhere. It comes up everywhere from startups working in the space and it comes up everywhere for health systems. Everyone is kind of go working through this gray area of for chart summarization with an LLM, should that be a regulated device? Is that clinical decision support? You know, and you can look at the you know FDA charts that we've had for a few years now that have tried to simply navigate people through, and uh, basically it's this big giant gray area in the middle. Mm -hmm. So people are saying, uh, 
and, and people are worried. So it's kind of one of the top few concerns from a health system side and also providers trying to figure out, are they liable? How does, how does this work? What's happening recently is the FDA is coming forward and actually um, the, the commissioner and the head of digital health uh, just a couple of days ago published a piece talking about uh, how health systems like they're going to be responsible. They're going to try to not as much hold developers responsible in startups, which has made some startups happy, but it should also make them concerned because health systems are you know, realizing that they're going to be holding the bag for this. Uh, what's being called for is uh, local evaluation and post-deployment monitoring. Um, things like this, which happen in other uh, industries and in other places where we have machine learning running rampant, we have things like ML ops and tools to measure this, but none of this infrastructure exists today in, in the healthcare setting. And so uh, now on the one hand, that's opportunity for startups, but it's also causing blocks and startups not getting adopted because health systems are unsure about what's, what's coming. And so kind of as we kind of march forward the months and years, we're going to get more clarity here, which I think will help. I think it will help guide people to what's safe, what's not safe, and where adoption can happen. Um, but now every hospital is kind of making it up uh, for themselves, which is exciting and terrifying. Great. And then maybe to push off of that a little bit. So a lot of, especially enterprise SaaS companies in the healthcare space, um, often are pushed up against this sales cycle of health systems and hospitals. I'd love to get your guys' perspective because as I've bumped around many a, a, a young startup, um, they often, this can be one of the biggest blockers for them really to get going. I'd love to hear how the startups you worked with have dealt with that issue, how you think startups should think about that, and maybe even how health systems should kind of think about that sales cycle. Because um, 12 to 24 months, that can, be a, that can be a long time for a young startup. I'm happy to take this to start. I know Justin has lived some, some more stories here as well. Um, you know, for a lot of our portfolio companies, and I'll start with my patient thing experience, it, it, it was a lot of the, like you said, like for the generation one sort of like healthcare SaaS companies, especially if you were trying to um, catch a new business model, for example, like value-based care payment sort of regimens that were not actually being billed for, um, like a lot of, a lot of the, um, the contracting challenges was trying to define what exactly the value capture is, how much can you attribute to your particular intervention and be paid for. And so I think a lot of the hacks that um, startups initially uses, uh, used to kind of get in the door were to find existing payment rails, CPT codes, for example, that they could start um, you know, billing for, sharing revenue in, uh, working with providers to build for, and coming in network, for example, as a, you know, like a fee-for-service biller of some type of code. So, for example, one of the past investments I made uh, at my old uh, venture firm uh, was in a company called Ansible Health. Uh, that provides kind of AI enabled COPD therapy, uh, really focused on kind of respiratory therapy. Uh, and the grand dream was basically to, to start converting some of um, uh, what, what was existing contract with Medicare Advantage plans into value-based contracts around kind of readmission and around DQG utilization. Um, but they started smartly by just trying to build existing kind of smoking cessation, RT codes, uh, putting kind of virtual remote patient monitoring codes and building kind of existing codes and then gradually right. showing outcomes and data over time so that they can win more value-based contracts in the later years. And that proved to be pretty successful uh, because it turns out, you know, at least in COPD, it's really tough to manage these patients. Primary care folks don't really feel comfortable. There's a great shortage of pulmonologists on the outpatient side that can manage COPD comfortably. And so we can help when you can kind of do it virtually in the kind of this hybrid at home type of model, um, a lot of payers get pretty excited about it. Uh, but it takes time, you know, Dan, to your point to develop that data. So, you know, if you can start in a fee for service way and then kind of gradually move to other outcomes, that can be exciting. Maybe what I can just build on is I can highlight why this is such an issue for, for startups. So when I have students in my classes come and say, hey, I want to sell to hospitals, really excited. I have a cool new widget. So what's the issue? You know, most startups, you know, when you know, Ashley and Sherman are funding them, you know, will fund them with, you know, 24 months-ish of, of, of runway. When your sales cycle is 24 months, uh, that's a huge issue because you could spend your entire level of funding just waiting for that hospital to, to get through contracting. Um, and so one thing a lot of people do is people don't start working with health systems because it's just that hard. As Sherman was mentioning, people figure out other business models to get paid on current payment rails and people don't start with hospitals. Sometimes people will start with smaller clinics, you know, an outpatient 
you know, urgent care center, smaller provider groups, if that's your focus, because they can get through faster, they can make decisions faster. So uh, one, you know, as Chairman mentioned War Story, when I was spending time as we got the Stanford Center for Digital Health off the ground, one of my you know, jobs as one of the you know, youngest members on the team was to work with startups and bring them into the Stanford ecosystem. I succeeded zero times. On the inside, I succeeded zero times on getting people to, to work through that in, in a few years. And so it, we should be just really cognizant of that as we think about innovation. Um, one of the challenges with the health system is you have a bunch of people who can say no and not that many people who, who can say yes. Whereas as you get into smaller organizations, maybe just the CEO can make a decision and get it done and, and get things adopted. And so uh, as a startup, you have to be very thoughtful about where you partner, how much runway you have, so you can actually get through that process if you're working with these, with these big systems. Great. And I'd love to hear the people who are figuring that out. Like what you're basically saying is that you have to be an entrepreneur. You have to like do the hard work to go from zero to one and get the flywheel going of your company. Um, nowadays in this, in this space, where are you guys seeing these founders coming from? Like we classically will be thinking of some clinician or some pure like technologist. Is that where you're seeing building these companies or are you seeing some different group or who, who's out there building this stuff and where are they coming? Are they coming from a design? Are they coming from, you know, studios like what Sherman was part of? Who, who's out there right now? I think we're seeing a lot of CEOs coming from outside healthcare. So that have done this in other places and been successful. Um, you know, I think the successful ones surround themselves with people who have been inside healthcare. So you kind of have that, you know, you're looking at sort of a different model and then you're supporting yourself with people who really understand the inside of the system and bringing those things together seems to be the most successful thing that we've seen. Still really hard. <laughs> and for that type of person, do they tend to be what we've been describing before with that sort of like FinTech or the administrative side of healthcare? Or are you seeing those people developing clinical applications as well? Uh, it's been both. Um, I think it doesn't, it doesn't have to be one or the other. I think that, you know, there's development on all sides right now. And um, uh, we're seeing them come in and, and you know, some, some of it's stuff that they know and is sort of their bread and butter. And sometimes it's a little bit outside of their comfort zone, but they're bringing that sales process and sort of the, the business side of things uh, to these new technologies. Yeah, I agree with Ashley. I think you're seeing people come from like inside healthcare, outside healthcare. For folks that are coming from outside healthcare, I think it's really interesting. Like it depends on the kind of the company form factor, for example. So one of the companies you recently backed uh, was uh, founded by the Instagram, the former Instagram CEO, uh, taking a crack at kind of food as medicine, but applied to like more healthcare use cases and inducing um, healthcare spend and preventative health and using diet as a lever essentially to reduce kind of costly emissions. Um, and so obviously he's an expert in like consumer oriented food product, but not an expert in like sort of healthcare sales and uh, proving out the ROI longer term. Um, and so I think that was a great um, example of a company that kind of brought those two worlds of like, you know, pure tech consumer sort of motives, but also kind of deep understanding of healthcare sales, cost, ROI, um, and all, all the creator, it's really just in kind of food as medicine company. Great. Now, all of you have been healthcare VC, VCs, um, and there's many people on this, on this call who are probably thinking about starting a startup or have a startup. What is special about a healthcare um, uh, VC versus a regular VC? Tell me something that, what's your guys' special sauce that's going to make you a little bit different? Like, why should, why should we choose this versus somebody, say, who is focused on enterprise SaaS, who's done a ton of those type of um, contracts and work with those companies in the past. What is there, basically, is there a specialty here and what is the value of that specialty? I'd love to hear from your guys' perspective. So I'll, I'll, I can take a crack at that first and then I'll, I'll combine it a little bit with the, with the last question. If a startup is going to be successful in the healthcare technology space, healthcare AI, they are both going to have to have deep understanding of growing technology businesses, SaaS businesses, and the healthcare landscape. There are tons and tons of war stories of brilliant technologists saying, healthcare is broken, I know technology, I'm gonna come off my high horse and go fix healthcare. Uh, all of those have failed. 
And we've seen catastrophic failures across the board from giant companies uh, to, to tiny companies uh, alike doing that. And so what's a little bit unique about you know, uh, you know, this group of people is you have people who understand the war stories of healthcare, how to contract, how to work through the trust building and uh, low moving nature of healthcare and can work with businesses where you're not going to be applying a technology framework saying, hey, you need to double sales, you know, every couple quarters, you know, why aren't your uh, systems contracting faster? Everything is broken, start over. And so you have to have those two perspectives. Um, otherwise, uh, just expectations are off and how fast you're moving, what you're focused on are, aren't going to be right. Yeah, I'll add to what Justin was saying. Yeah, I would, I would say, you know, to put my Andreessen hat on for a second, we have like an incredible platform team at our firm that specializes specifically in healthcare, everything from like healthcare uh, clinician recruiting to build kind of a medical advisory board and a medical practice, you know, kind of logistics involved in that to a medical policy board. So people that are advocating on behalf of Andreessen's portfolio companies on the Hill from a data policy, from an AI policy perspective, um, all of that's kind of specific healthcare expertise that we've brought onto the team because we know to Justin's point that these uh, journeys look very circuitous, look very nonlinear. Uh, they grow very slowly. They grow at different rates than pure enterprise software, for example, that Andreessen also invests in. But we've decided to specialize our funds for that very reason, because they're completely uh, different uh, type of return profiles, return velocities. And so we have to be, you know, arguably more patient, uh, more intentional about where we invest, for example, as a fund when we're looking at healthcare. Um, and yeah, I would say like, you know, there's also specialized skill sets that come with that as well. I'm actually not, I'm not the only practicing commission on my own team. There's other practicing commissions that invest alongside me. There's PhDs yeah. similar to Ashley's background that specifically focus on like biotech, for example, therapeutics that we also invest in. All of these require like deep specialized expertise that doesn't, you know, innately just come from looking at a bunch of healthcare companies. Yep. Great. Yeah, I think the thing I add, would add to that too is venture is a relationship business and, you know, looking at our partners and the relationships they have within healthcare systems, et cetera, um, which gets you to the right place to try to get that sale going and, and really understanding what it takes, who you need to talk to, et cetera, um, is huge. Great. So I'd love to dig a little deeper on something Justin brought up a little bit. So you guys have a special lens that most of us don't get to see because we tend to very much only see the successful companies that come out, right? But you guys get to see the ones who go the other direction and either fail or, or don't necessarily meet the milestones that they're going. I'd love to hear at least some of the pattern matching you've had on some of those ones who have just not gone the way that we all were hoping them to, to do. Um, and you don't have to give us specifics necessarily. We'd love specifics, of course, but like we'd love to hear some of those stories or some of what you've gleaned from ones that went the wrong direction or south. I can start with, with a few stories. So the venture capital has behind it the best marketing machine ever. You only hear about the success stories. Everything's exciting up and to the right when actually the majority of companies fail. And uh, you know, even my, my old boss, as I was starting, said, if you're not failing 80% of the time, then the 20% of the time you weren't even shooting big enough. And so this, the business is about home runs and most of the companies and the investments actually don't get there. And most people don't know this. And so I think it's worth starting, starting there. Uh, within healthcare, uh, one of the things that um, it is really difficult is truly understanding the business model. And this is something specifically I see, unfortunately, a lot of healthcare insiders and specifically physicians get wrong. Uh, something that goes along the lines of this, and, and this is littered with companies who get funded and go on, but still don't make it, which is, this is good for the physicians, or this is good for patients, and I'll figure some value-based care model later um, once I get scale and things get going. So like, don't, don't worry about the economics for how and why you know, the person adopting is, is going to pay for this. Yeah. Uh, the, the, and that happens again and again. If you go through even, you know, digital health companies that get funded, if you, if you can't explain the business model in super simple terms without a bunch of assumptions being made, it's probably not going to work. And, and people skip that. People say, oh, business isn't important. Like the clinical, the science is perfect. The technology is perfect. And 
uh, I'll, I'll just say that it's not enough. It, it, it's not enough to, to figure out scale and ultimately be successful. All of the things have to make sense, have to be simple and have to be scalable. And so uh, lots of companies, companies in our portfolio and others, you know, the CPT codes weren't there. The new, you know, new modality was coming out, but it was hoping that the business model would show up and it didn't. And so, um, you know, you can make big bets and hope that these things will come later. But if it's not simple uh, for how you're, how you're going to get paid and why every actor in your system is incentivized to do that, um, we, we see failure after failure in healthcare. Yeah. And that makes sense with, you know, there's been a lot of, you know, we've gone through this whole social media cycle in the last couple of decades. And I think as you're describing, there may be a narrative there that they didn't know what their business model was going to be from the start, but they knew what their business model was going to be. They just knew that they had to get gigantic before that business model made sense. Um, I think that's what you're kind of getting at. Sherman, Ashley, do you have anything else you were thinking about in terms of, or stories within this space about patterns that you've learned? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'll share my own startup's journey at Patient Ping, where I was an early product employee. Um, you know, ultimately that company did fine. You know, we exited for half a billion. It wasn't the monster home run that Justin was alluding to that generates the 10x returns that every venture capitalist wants. Um, but it was a decent outcome for everyone involved. And I think the reason why is because, you know, we didn't realize how quickly data would be commoditized from just a pure data layer perspective. I think now in today's world, if we had to redo that company again, um, we realize a lot of the value comes from the services that you wrap around the data. You know, I think it's one thing to just show people what care coordination gaps look like, but it's another thing to actually help close those gaps and get, you know, for reimbursed for it from a services perspective. So I think increasingly, even if within our own portfolio, you're seeing a lot more AI enabled services, um, interventions that can actually capture value as opposed to SaaS it just illuminates what the data problem is initially. I think um, those data, just pure data businesses um, without any sort of like value capture or services around it, um, it it's, it's tough to build a, a, a company longer term in that space. Right. I, I was thinking way more basic of, you know, founders, leadership, bad clinical data. <laughs> Uh, too early to market, like you, you built something and people aren't quite ready for it or too late to market where, where it's sort of already had its peak. Uh, but I think, um, Justin hit on a point of just business model. If you haven't figured out how you're going to make money and it's not, um, hasn't been flushed out, uh, before you start, it's, it's really easy to get into a situation where you've just burned through your cash and, and you can no longer support it. And you see those companies flame out pretty quick. Okay. So another thing that most people don't get to see unless you're on the VC side is how the process actually happens for one of these companies to get funded, especially in the early stage, right? I think the general narrative is like, we just show up one day, we just cold email you guys and we'd show up and we'd tell you our story and then you give us a check, right? Um, I was wondering if maybe what would be helpful, especially within the healthcare AI specific space, if you can give maybe an example of like how you went from even hearing about a company all the way to what came into making that investment decision in them. Um, because I think that would be very helpful for us to understand like what is actually going on in the investor's mind when they, when they hear these stories. Sure, I can start. Um... I forget who said this before, but it's very much a relationship business. A lot of the founders that we've backed in our portfolio, we've we've known for years through some, you know, sort of collaboration, through formal portfolio companies, through just being thought leaders in a particular space. Um, and so I think it's it's rare that we, you know, for example, uh, Dan, get a pure cold email that's completely cold, and we're able to take it much farther because we just not, haven't spent enough game film to know how quickly that founder can move, the team, get comfortable yep. with it. Um, on, you know, rare cases, you know, I think you can make it quite far if the data is really compelling, if the team is super stellar and we just kind of jump out on page. But more likely than not, somebody on a team has had, you know, some type of past experience or we can reference, reference them really well with people that we've known and trusted for years. Um, but give one example. We just announced an investment yesterday in a company called Alchemy Health. Uh, this was the uh, two former executives from Pill, uh, not Pill Pack, True Pill, sorry, um, that was in the deep in the pharmacy space. And it was an investment we made in the 340B Medicaid space to enable uh, essentially pharmacy services for federally qualified health centers and safety net hospitals to be able to set up their own pharmacies in-house on site. 
Um, and this was like a deeply like one like regulatory uh, burned in problem uh, because 340B pharmacies are tightly regulated um, Two, like require a lot of pharmaceutical knowledge. And so when we started to hear about this team, uh, one, we had a lot of gameplay on them from having seen prior rounds of TruePill. We were not investors in, in TruePill um, as a firm, um, but have heard a lot about that company and seen them at multiple kind of checkpoints throughout the stage. Uh, and two, I, I had a personal look at the founder going back eight years when I was a Stanford student uh, working with uh, Peter Park. Um, and that led that particular relationship led to a lot of velocity in the deal. Um, and allowed us to get really comfortable really fast about how quickly the team was moving specifically in the pharmacy space. The things that we had to do risk though on our side that, you know, you know, check the boxes for us is like, is this market big enough? You know, it's a 340B highly regulated space. There's only a few three, uh, you know, a few kind of customer segments that this team could really go after. But for us, we justified it because the value capture was tremendous. Um, if you could really uh, improve sort of the, the dispensing, um, the percentage of uh, patients that were getting access to life-saving treatments that they couldn't before, improving that access was uh, greatly kind of um, uh, outshone the number of customers that would have increased because of their services. Um, so, yeah, I think a lot of the things that we focus on in the diligence process is really getting comfortable with market size, um, getting a, a peek under the hood with the existing pharmacies they're working with, referencing a lot of their customers, and then learning a lot more about the space because it was so tightly regulated. Yeah, I'll echo that. And we do a ton of research. So, uh, you know, oftentimes we'll have a theme, uh, so a place or an area we're interested in, and we'll do a deep dive on that and understand, we'll do a market landscape, really understanding where there's gaps, et cetera. Um, you know, sometimes that's proactive looking for companies, but most of the time it's uh, just kind of general knowledge. So when a company comes uh, to us, we we sort of know where to put it into that map. Uh, but, you know, Sherman's right. It's a hundred percent relationship. It's oftentimes, you know, you're pitching, not the company that you're pitching me, but you're pitching me your next company and the next company after that. Uh, so what I always encourage entrepreneurs to do is really make relationships with uh, investors, even if the, their current company is not something um, that they're going to invest in, um, just get to know them. Um, again, you know, we love meeting entrepreneurs and, and we love what, what you know, obviously um, they're doing lots of great things out there. Not everything is going to match up with your investment thesis. Um, and, and so really creating those relationships uh, is huge. And, and, and then you'll, you know, hopefully at some point in time, you'll hit on something that, that matches the investment thesis. Um, uh, with with that relationship and, and you know the, the chemistry is already there and you're you're excited to go. Uh, when we see something that we love, you know, we uh, do a very thorough due diligence. We want to understand um, everything about the science, the market, the competitors. Um, we do a ton of modeling. Uh, we want to know how uh, we're going to make our returns uh, for our LPs. Um, so there's a ton that goes into it, uh, and it can take a long time. And I know because I've sat in the entrepreneur seat as well. Of it's super frustrating. Of you know, you're like, hey, we're ready to go, and your investor's like, I'm still working on this thing. I'm doing interviews, etc. Uh, and it can feel very frustrating, um, for sure. But no, it's all in kind of effort of one getting to know your space really well. Great. And Justin, I'd love to hear how you went through the process of meeting someone and bringing them all the way through where the where you find those people, where those contacts came from. And really, like when you went down to decide, am I going to yes or no do this? Like, what were the things that were really making the biggest difference for you? Yeah, so an example uh, and one thing that makes it helpful or, you know, where do I even start you know, finding venture capitalists is you know, like Sherman is writing about topics. The, the reason he's writing about topics is because he's doing the work to do a deep dive on the space and he's interested in usually finding companies in those spaces, right? So before when I was a venture capitalist, why was I writing these articles on venture cap on generative AI and medicine? You know, one, because I was just interested and couldn't look away, but two, because I wanted to show I knew something about the space as a venture capital and then allow startup founders to, to reach out to me. So a, a previous example, um, an area I've written about, was very excited about was oncology, how oncology uh, was going to change. I looked at all the companies in the space and then a, a founder um, through their network, so actually through another investor had seen this and then reached out through that investor to have a discussion. Uh, so still cold emails as Sherman mentioned are tough, but reached out through another investor to make the introduction. Hey, I saw interested in this space. Here's my blurb, why I'm excited. Um, the 
team, the, the traction, the, the product and where they work. Um, so then I'll go through, you know, what actually goes through the evaluation criteria. So for um, slightly different than in medical device and in biopharma, where I would say in that category, science is the number one factor. Uh, when you're thinking about software businesses or SaaS businesses, it's team. It's team is probably is one, two, and three. And so that's why Sherman mentioned it was so important. And they wanted to go back years and years with these founders to make sure um, that they are, are, are referenced, uh, you know, are able to do this, are able to move at the pace um, that might allow them to, to be successful. So that's that's where things start um, is with the team. Then you're going through, does the product make sense? Do the competitors make sense? How does it fit in the landscape? What is the early traction? Is the market big enough? You know, all these things that, you know, you can Google or chat GPT now to make sure you're checking off the list. Um, all of those things have to have to go through to get to a yes. And so what, what's helpful just when people think about the numbers and as Ashley mentioned, why fundraising can be so difficult is investors will meet a hundred companies maybe to make a single investment. So venture capital, again, it sounds super, most of it is saying no. Most of it is saying no uh, up to founders as you kind of go through through these checks. And you know, as a founder, your job is to be able to answer these questions and get people to say yes. So just to talk for a tiny bit about my own funding raising experience as I flipped back to the other side as a founder, I wrote the investment memo for all my investors. I wrote all the reasons, what was coming, what we were doing, who we were, our current product, our current traction, the competitive landscape, why we could fail. I wrote that all out for them so I could move them quickly through this process. And then we could have a discussion on, okay, now that that's on the table, you know, do we want to do this or not? Um, and so just as different examples and ways that people can try to make it all the way through where the default answer is no. Yeah. When you were describing, that's great. Thank you so much for everybody being so candid. Um, when you were describing that team is number one, two, and three, right? Um, when you evaluate that team, what, what are you looking for? Is it really their, especially if we move beyond just the pure like device or, or, um, biomedical space, right? When you're evaluating these people, is it really their experiences, their credentials? What, what is it about that team that made you Sherman say yes to the person, you know, and, and for, for the rest of you guys too, what makes you say yes to that team? Yeah, I think for me, it's tremendously focused on what we call founder market fit. Like, why does this particular founder have the unique and uh, advantage and edge in this particular market that they're going after? Um, you know, is it the expertise, Stan, to your point? Is it the velocity that they've had in prior businesses? Is it the velocity that has shown us in the you know short year that they've worked on the idea before they've pitched us? Um, but proving how and, and kind of defending how you have founder market fit is, is really important. You know, just to give an example for that company that we just announced yesterday, you know, both of these founders have spent more than uh, like two decades kind of building in the pharmacy space. And they had a lot of expertise, a lot of regulatory sort of um, uh, sort of knowledge about how to move quickly, specifically in the 340B space. Um, and, you know, Truepill was a tremendously successful company by, by, all, by many counts and, uh, you know, proving out, you know, that they had kind of the successful cycle there uh, and taking the learnings from that type of company uh, and moving into this, this new company that we invested in, um, I think gave us a lot of confidence that they would figure it out. I think the open questions that we had. Um, we're, we're, you know, to Justin's point, purely around, you know, the secondary kind of like the tertiary pieces of the investment is like, is this going to be a big, you know, investment risk for other types of investment you want to make in pharmacy? For example, number one, number two, is the space big enough? You know, and I would, I would argue, you know, venture financing is may not be the right financing for all types of ideas. You know, you have to prove a big enough outcome for investors to get truly excited, like a 10 X return, for example, a hundred billion dollar market. Like sometimes the numbers don't make it all the way to that scale. And you have to be able to defend that uh, when you're, when you're pitching an investor, venture investor. One thing to, to add is it, it's one thing, you know, Sherman mentioned, Hey, this was a former investor of Instacart or has two decades of experience. Lots of people don't have that when they're going. Maybe it's their first time founding a company. And so then what can we look for, you know, as an investor to get to get through with that? And so just a, a super simple um, tactical version that I've looked for and kind of more first time founders is, you know, do they actually know more about the market and have they 
thought through the second, third, and fourth order questions and things I have. So let, let, let me explain what, what that means, because this is how, you know, people who don't have that, you know, decades of experience and track record can, can prove it. So for example, um, in this, uh, within the oncology space, right, I've written about this some, um, but I'm looking at a hundred different things. When I'm speaking with that founder, do they already know the second, third, and fourth question I'm going to answer? Do they have thoughtful answers about this? And are they teaching me something in the call? Because it's a bad sign if you're coming to me and you're telling me about a space and I know more about it than you. This is your job as a founder. You're spending your life on this space. You, you better at least know more than a baseline than me, someone who's, who's spent some time go, going through it. And so these are ways where have you thought about the business? Do you know, do you know the key risks that you're going to face? Can you talk about them? Can you articulate why you're preventing them, how you're going to navigate through the other competitors in the market, what's happening in policy that's important to you. And can you just know so much more than the investors you're talking about if you don't have the track record to fall on? Um, and so this is where people can start to stand out if they don't have the pedigree um, that shows they've done this forever. Great. Yeah, and I think on the, the pedigree front, you know, your experience is always really important, uh, whether it be this exact role or were you the CEO of your last company or are you, you know, um, starting really early in your career. I think the things that are important are, you know, not only what you've done, but also how you've um, dealt with uh, hardships or hard things that have happened, you know, how have you responded to that? Um, you know, what is, you know, what's the, 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 um, how are you using that to kind of propel your your current business? Uh, also looking at not just C CEO, but also the team that you're surrounding yourself with too, of where are you weak? Where do you not have um, uh, experience? So we were talking about, uh, you know, bringing in tech CEOs, but what's your healthcare team that you have around you? Um, how does that, how do you sort of fill in the gaps and, and, you know, what's the total sum of the team, not just of the CEO? Uh, so it's really looking kind of holistically at the whole team um, yeah, can you answer the the second third level questions? Um, you know, how coachable are you as well? So, uh, are you willing to take feedback, um, or you know, be challenged and not totally fall apart? So, looking at definitely all those different things. Yep. Um, I'm going to take an audience question here real quickly. Um, so, uh, the the healthcare space, especially from the data uh, standpoint, is very dominated by the big EMR companies like Epic and Cerner. Right. When when we see a lot of these new healthcare AI startups, they're often trying to integrate or deal with the fact that most of the data that they would like access to is in is in a third party commercial system. I'd love to hear how you guys think about those companies that are either interfacing or in some way have to touch the EMR and what you what your investment thesis really is around those type of companies that need that integration. Yeah, I was actually typing an answer to this. It's, it's a great question. Um, I, I think a, a lot of nuance here, but one, um, there's a lot of data that is captured in the EHR, Dan, to, 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 to your point. Um, but there's also a lot of like net new data that is either too unstructured to fully capture an EHR or creates value in a way that EHRs are not fundamentally set up to capture. So for example, you know, one of the things we published about extensively, kind of like the holy grail um, type of problem is like, you know, what if you could, um, combine EHR data in a way to basically in real time run clinical trials on data that, that EHR has access to, um, you know, not, not in the kind of the retrospective and kind of like a uh, way that we're currently doing, but, you know, in real time, you know, slice patient data, patient segments and create sort of, you know, almost like RCT trials virtually um, to show how patients are doing on one track versus the other. You know, Epic's not fundamentally set up from a business perspective to capture value in that space. And two, you know, I think, you know, the current payment rails, for example, for billing and compliance are not set up in the same way that clinical trials are. So I think that would be like an example of where you could pull data, intersect it with other sort of, um, um, you know, pharmaceutical uh, data on, on the other side and create a really interesting company. Um, the second piece is, you know, I, I would say, you know, for example, scri taking scribing as a use case. I think a lot of folks view that scribing it will be commoditized in the coming years. A lot of VCs think that. Um, but for a lot of the scribing companies that, you know, that we've seen, that that's not their end target. The goal was to get enough fidelity on sort of the training 
behind, around the scribing, the personalization of how you know, like one individual physician uses that scribe um, and create value, you know, for example, that might uh, end up capturing other pieces of our value chain, for example, order sets, styles of presentation, style of notes, uh, templates that, you know, Epic might not have access to because they're trying to serve a much broader audience. Um, yep. And so, you know, I think that's another example where you would start kind of maybe fundamentally the wedge, but that company has to grow horizontally in a way that does not compete with Epic. Yep. I would just say it used to be a, like a death sentence for a startup. It's like, oh, I have to be fully integrated and it's going to change workflows. And there's a few things that are different today. One, there's just more machine readable ways to get that data out. Of, of the EMR than there ever have before, and you know, open standards and the ONC, you know, slowly making more and more data available. So it's it's not a death sentence anymore. You know, as Sherman mentioned, if you're combining outside data with EMR data, you can start to do new things. Um, the the other thing I would mention is uh, we're now starting to see some of these new generative AI tools be so exciting that you know clinicians are willing to step out of the record and spend time elsewhere because it's helping them get their job done similar to as Sherman was mentioning, ambient documentation tools. And so people are starting to generate data with some data from the EMR or you know, at least having some read-write access to put it back in. Uh, but there's all sorts of different levels of integration that, that people can do. Um, you know, interestingly, and this is well, just to make it uh, you know, a little bit more a hot take, uh, right now what we're seeing is RPA or robotic process automation where people are scraping from the EMR has been this you know, giant no-no and mm -hmm. the EMRs have tried to prevent this. With how easy it is now with uh, large language models to do capturing of screens and videos and structure information, I think there's going to be a whole wave of startups where the EMRs vendors are no longer going to be able to block this. People are just mm -hmm. going to skip any formal integration, go straight from videos and other tools um, and just extract that information. That will end up in a whole separate set of battles back and forth, uh, but people, there are more and more ways to get information out of the EMR and integrate, and I think we'll, we'll see that. You just basically said that lawyers will have jobs for the near future, or at least the Unfor AI. Unfortunately, I mean, fortunately, uh, yeah. whichever way. Yeah, it happen uh, soon enough. Let's, uh, yeah. I hope that, that someone decides that Epic is too slow um, and they come up with something better. So I keep thinking of like the Uber model of, you know, the taxi system was broken and someone came and just invented right around it. And I hope that that happens sooner rather than later uh, for electronic health records. Great. Well, I'm going to, we're going to wrap up now. I want to really thank our, our three investors here who have come and uh, had their, this very candid conversation. I think it's been wonderful for us. I can't thank you guys enough.